Hello and welcome back to Pharmacist Diaries, the podcast that reveals the secret lives of pharmacists from where their journeys began, where they are now and everything in between. I am your host Anisha Patel and on today's episode we are fortunate enough to spend an hour of time with Richard Goodwin. I'm super excited to release this week's episode because Richard and I immediately connected because we both have split roles between education and pediatrics. He is the current principal education and training pharmacist at Great Ormond Street Hospital. He started his career as a step pharmacist at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. Similar to me, he started with a residency. He built an amazing foundation as a clinical pharmacist. During his time at the hospital and rotating to lots of different specialties, he discovered pediatrics. He chose a rotation at the Evelina and hasn't turned back since. Throughout the episode, you will hear little insights here and there from Richard incorporating education into his daily practice in a variety of roles. You can definitely see his passion for helping other people to grow and learn. I really admire Richard's dedication to the next generation of pharmacists and we have so much to share and so much in common in terms of what it is that we'd like to achieve for the next generation. One of the key takeaways from this episode is integrating students into the workplace as early as possible during their pharmacy degree. We really talk about the value of getting these students hands-on experience so they can make the most out of their working life once they become a pharmacist. I also really appreciated the fact that Richard likes to journal. Though he does it in his head and I might write it on paper or use an app, he loves to reflect on his day-to-day life as a pharmacist and use this experience to grow and develop professionally. He is also a massive advocate for understanding the emotional and mental health of staff within the workplace and finding solutions that support their well-being on a day-to-day basis. As we all know, the field of pharmacy is not immune to burnout, stress and mental health challenges. So it was wonderful to have a conversation with Richard because he's addressing these issues on a day-to-day basis and finding solutions to support his staff. Overall, this episode is a fantastic reminder of all the opportunities that pharmacy has to offer. Whether you're into pediatrics, research, education or business, there is a place for you within the field. Enjoy the episode. Well, welcome to Pharmacist Diaries, Richard. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for making the time for me and uh, really looking forward to getting to know you and your journey. Um, I always start the episode with uh, why did you become a pharmacist in the first place? So I didn't really know what I wanted to do, if I'm being really honest. I think a lot of pharmacists come into the profession with that kind of um, thought process. So I love science. I was a bit of a science geek. I could not write to save my life. So something like law was totally out of the question. English was not my strong point. So I was like, let's focus on something with science. Um And I wanted to be quite hands-on. I'm quite chatty. I like talking to people. So I didn't want to be stuck in a lab. Being a nurse seemed a little bit too gooey for my liking. Like, I didn't want to particularly, like, you know, get as as hands-on as a nurse would do. Um, And so my uncle and aunt both were pharmacists for Boots um, when I was growing up. So I kind of knew a little bit about what they did. Um... And my aunt was one of the kind of first uh, prescribers in asthma when I was kind of growing up. So I knew a little bit, but they didn't really live close enough for me to ever do work experience with them. But it seemed really interesting. So I applied to university to do Eastern philosophy and Japanese or pharmacy. (laughs) Um, so writing a personal statement was really, really challenging, trying to get both of those in. Um, which meant I got accepted for some pharmacy schools and actually a couple of places for um, Eastern philosophy. Um, but but yeah, it got, got turned down quite rightly so looking back um, by two institutions that felt that maybe I lacked focus in where I wanted to go with my <laughs> life, um, which, you know, was was fair. Fair enough. And I understand you went to Bradford and did the sandwich course. Yes. What was your reason for choosing that? Um. So I got accepted at Bradford and Brighton. So I could just kind of weigh up my options. And I really liked the idea of being able to go away and earn some money because four years seemed like a really long time, um, especially back then when I was kind of 18. And, you know, that was nearly the whole of my secondary education going again. So um, it was kind of close enough to home 
that I could see my family and things, but not so close that they drop in on me. Um, so, and I think when we went down to Brighton, the train journey was just horrific, which is what put me off. And everybody seemed really sporty and not like me. So um, ended up in Bradford and loved it. Absolutely Amazing. loved it. What was your experience of going into a work environment, um, you know, like the training pharmacist year, which is different to what we're doing at the moment? Obviously, more courses are coming out with sandwich yeah. uh, sort of um, an em- environment where you're integrating into the workplace six months at a time throughout the course. What was that experience like for you in terms of your development as a pharmacist? So it was really daunting, but I also think it really focuses you because you know it's going to get really practical and really hands-on really early in the course. And I think if I'd have done the four years, I knowing the person I am, I would have probably coasted for the first three years and then really picked it up in year four because I knew I, that was when I was kind of going to really hit the ground running. So by kind of bringing that placement much earlier on in the course, it was really good because I felt you had this looming deadline and I work very well to deadlines. If you know, if you speak to anyone, if there's no deadline, it doesn't get done. And so that really worked with me. Um, And I think it really helped me understand what I needed to achieve from the placement. So for example, I went into um, community pharmacy for my first one. So a lot of it was more around like the soft skills development. So like counseling people and, you know, thinking about MURs and um, over the counter medicines and looking at the performance standards in a more strategic way to be like, okay, these are the ones that I'm more able at my knowledge base right now to address. And therefore I'm going to leave the other ones that maybe were a bit more complex or maybe required a little bit more clinical reasoning to be able to do later on Um, and again the uni was really good in terms of helping you do that because I purposely picked the community placement first and then the hospital one because I wanted that kind of especially back I mean I did it 50 10 and 15 years ago like hospital was definitely seen as the more clinical um, kind of roll back then. So I kind of picked that at the end of the, the five years so that I'd have more knowledge to be able to facilitate that. I love the idea of the sandwich course. And I love that at the moment with uh, King's College London, I'm working on M Farm placements as a project. So we're trying, we're going through GPHC reaccreditation. We are looking at what students will be doing in order to become prescribers by 2026 and really stepping up what placements are going to look like and how long um, students are going to spend in the workplace. And I am so excited. Yeah. I I know you're excited because you're in the education space. I know that it, it gets us hyped up and there's a reason for it because I think the students these days, and it's not their fault, but they really lack the life skill and the experience of actually doing a job. Yeah. And part of the experience of going into the workplace for longer periods of time early on in the course really helps you to get that professional mindset. And like you said, you had that looming deadline. You knew what kind of standards that you were going to have to demonstrate so you kind of like pick up on those responsibilities and you know work towards gaining the skills that you need to become a pharmacist and you're showing those skills along the way and you knew interestingly that community would be a good place to start where maybe actually routine becomes a little bit easy on a day-to-day basis compared to a hospital environment and that being in a hospital later on in your um, university degree would be more beneficial when you've got that clinical knowledge. And it's the same in terms of what we're trying to build for the students now is that we're integrating them into uh, a workplace environment. But we're looking at skills like building empathy and, um, you know, demonstrating compassion, like what are your consultation skills like approaching a patient and having a conversation rather than just, hey, take one tablet a day. Um In the first couple of years. And I know that you want to say 10 things right now, (laughs) but it's really exciting. Like I'm really looking forward to it. So it's really nice that you've been through that course and that we're taking a full circle and kind of going through the, the, you know, the advantages of doing that. 
Absolutely. And I think as you you mentioned there, it's all about kind of thinking about what skills we're going to try and educate on or, or evidence at different stages throughout that kind of quite long process of four to five years. And I think that's what's really key for yourself as providers of, of kind of education and providers of access to patients alongside community and GP placements is really to look at what our skills are and how we can help students get the exposure to do that. But definitely, I think the the more you get early on, it really allows you to reflect even off placement because it's when somebody's, you know, chatting to you in a lecture that you can be like, oh, actually, that totally makes sense. Like, I really get what they're saying about diabetes because I had this placement. And even though maybe an adherence problem wasn't with the diabetic patient in your case, in the academic world, you'll have done it with maybe HIV or the you know, antibiotics or something. And it really helps you just reflect. And I think as well, I found as students, it brought us closer together, even though we spent six months away from each other, we kind of came back and really became a peer resource for each other. And especially because some had done hospital and some had done community, you know, when we decided to pick our groups for kind of joint work moving on, we weren't just picking the people that we were friends with. We were seeking out people that had done the opposite placement, knowing that they had a different skill set to maybe we did. And then being able to utilize that so that we could do better at the university kind of cases and stuff that we were presented with. Oh, sounds like yeah. Bradford's the place to be. Um, yeah, no, it sounds really good. I think there's, you know, so much excitement for students who are going into the university course at the moment because you're spending so many more hours in placements that we're having to actively seek more hospitals, more GP um, surgeries, more community pharmacists for students to go. And the best part about it is they get the whole, you know, host of you know, variety. So they have that reflective experience of, hey, I worked five weeks in this hospital and I did five weeks in GP land last year, but actually I can see myself. I can visualize myself more in the GP role. I really liked having that sort of clinic set up and seeing, you know, diabetic patients day in, day out. I really was inspired by what I saw the pharmacists doing and I can see myself doing that or I'm really good educating patients or empowering them or I'm a great listener so these are the skills that I can use in that job. And I think as well being able to get to see more and more people so for example you know if you're in a hospital often you're rotational and you might work with quite a lot of pharmacists but that's not always the same in different settings you know some people when you're working maybe in community didn't like the fact that there was loads of locums because it makes planning more difficult but actually the great thing about you know if you're in somewhere with loads of locums that actually you get to see loads of different styles of doing pharmacy because there's no one way and I'm sure you'll hear if you kind of listen to all of the podcasts that you know we at GOSH have very different views of the way that we practice the art of pharmacy and I think one of the really big benefits of increasing the placements and you know as you say you're going to be going over multiple different organizations and and different sectors is actually looking and reflecting back and think you know what I worked with Richard and he really did x well but oh my god I'd never do what he did in that situation and I think maybe Hong or Rasha or Jane would approach that pediatric question in a very different way and I think that's a massively important part of learning, um, especially for a profession whereby certain pockets of us can feel quite isolated in terms of, you know, other pharmacy professionals that we're able to work with. And I think that's going to be massively invaluable for students kind of moving forward. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, so from Bradford and I guess throughout your university degree, what were your thoughts back then on what type of pharmacist you wanted to be or where you wanted to go? So I did quite a lot with the BPSA. So I did kind of their, uh, some of their PR work. I was a vice president for them. So was quite well tapped into different areas. Um, and I'd, I was really torn between owning and running my own pharmacy I loved the idea of being an independent pharmacist. I'm quite business focused um, and, you know, I've just done an MBA or just doing an MBA, really get excited about the business side. And I think really interestingly, it's become a bit of a 
maybe a, a naughty thought in pharmacy nowadays about business, which we're so moving towards the clinical element that that maybe we're not giving as much um emphasis on, on on the business aspects and business skills so absolutely love that or wanted to go to a hospital and I was 50 50 all the way up you know I chatted to a couple of people up in Scotland who were selling their pharmacies um, and had thought about going down that process um, and then the hospital and I'm not gonna lie this is probably not what people want to hear but what came down to it was location. I got offered an amazing hospital um, job on the STEP program in London and the places of pharmacies that um, kind of I, I was able to purchase were in like the highlands of Scotland and that just wasn't going to um, gel with my lifestyle. And so I ended up being a hospital pharmacist. <laughs> amazing. I love that. And Back then and still, you know, the STEP program is extremely competitive. And if you get an interview and you get offered the job, like, you can't say no. Yeah. It's so I, hard. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know that it's a really good opportunity. You know how much you're going to learn and grow. And you've got this tight network of pharmacists that you're going to be working with day in, day out who support you in the same journey when it comes to a residency type role. I mean, definitely, I have made lifelong friendships from my residency life. Um and even as mums now, we've got like, you know, the mums WhatsApp group from Resi Life. You know, we're all become parents now and life has really changed. But it's amazing how it can bring people together. Absolutely. Um, and I so think, it's a good opportunity. Yeah. And I think I think it's right for certain people. Um and I don't think it's for everyone, but if it's if it's right for you, your kind of learning development just goes, you know, straight through the roof, Leek. Um it's so stressful and looking back on it you think why the hell did you ever put yourself through that but I you, I wouldn't have had it any other way and it's really interesting that you mentioned about the mums um, group because I've literally been messaging a couple of my friends today and we're going to go um, and book a day off and go out to like Whitstable or the North Kent coast um, I've been to all of their weddings they That's amazing. you know and as you say it's kind of like because there's there's so few people that do it you kind of bonded through this like semi-traumatic life event that you do for a couple of years but it's absolutely amazing and I wouldn't have personally started my career any other way. I had a conversation with a GSTT pharmacist yeah. um, who was like I've got P uh, like PTSD from hearing the bleep like if I hear the bleeping sound yeah. it really freaks me out because of what we went through as as steps. Yeah, I mean, but some of the funniest stories of my career come from it. I mean, there was one day where I just kind of rocked on the floor and cried and pushed a fridge out um, into the corridor because there was too many bleeps going on. And I just, my brain was like, it needs to quieten down some way. So I was like, let's just switch the power off, like move the fridges out, like it'll be fine. Um and a time when the robot broke and I was on the phone to the uh, security team in Germany and they're like, you're going to get have to get like the rod and you're going to have to like put some paper towel over it and suck all the dust out of the the rod. And I'm just like, it's a glass fronted robot and I'm going to be there. And it was just not a good luck <laughs> at three o'clock on a, a, a on a Sunday morning. Um, yeah. But no, really, really funny things. Um like the time I broke all the fentanyl ampules and I didn't realise until I was walking around and I got bloody footprints um, and had to escalate it to the uh, um, site leads um, and we had to do loads of datexes and loads of really funny stories that kind of, you know... It Wouldn't up. happen on a day on a day to day in a, in a normal band six role for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think it makes you take a lot of responsibility Um and for me, that hospital had a lot of support as well. And um, so it felt measured, um, which I think is really important nowadays that, you know, yes, we do put people into these quite high pressure situations, but then thinking about how do we support you? And I think one of the things I probably noticed maybe over the last 10 years, the support has gone probably it, there was always clinical support for the safety of the patients. But I think now as managers, we're much more thinking around the support that we need to give our employees to make sure that they are emotionally still able uh, to cope. So it's not just that kind of very 
practical clinical focused support but yeah absolutely. wraparound support and and covid has highlighted that as well simply because of the general kind of stress and impact emotionally and physically a lot of people have been through we've been working hard yeah and our residents have been doing way more kind of shifts than they would usually be doing to support each other especially with all the sickness within the department um so yeah supporting their emotional and mental health is is a big priority and i think it's been fascinating hasn't it i think the minute we started allowing ourselves to have those conversations without feeling like it was awkward or it wasn't belonged in the workplace like I think it's just mushroomed and, and it's brilliant because actually people can come and talk to you about much more things than they, they did do before, maybe. I mean, I've always been fairly lucky with with the teams that I've worked with. I'm very open. I'm very much a heart on my sleeve kind of guy. If I'm having a bad day, like it will show on my face. Like, but also like I'm very open about what I kind of do on the weekends and kind of my life in general. Um, just because I spend so much time here, I, that that's important to me. And I get other people are a little bit more maybe closed off and want to keep a bit more separation and that's fine but I've always found because I'm quite open that people have responded really well to that so um I have always been quite good in terms of kind of making sure that we're we're able to support each other yeah it makes you uh, a little bit more approachable and it's it's not the other person's fault if they are a bit closed off no. they're just being professional and minding their own business and getting on with the job but actually when you have someone who's very friendly and talks about themselves and their feelings and their emotions or if they're having a good day or a bad day it opens the doors for them to do the same in return and it makes them feel a bit more comfortable especially when they're junior um and they don't necessarily want to show not their fears, but they're not good at something or they're finding something challenging. They don't want it to look badly or reflect badly on them. But actually, it, it's good to have open con conversations and grow from these situations as well, which is great. Yeah. So I guess uh, from resi life and being a, being a step... Um, what areas of interest did you have at the time? Obviously, pediatrics was uh, was a big thing. So you must have uh, rotated through to Evelina and, and loved it. No, oh. no. Um, really interestingly, I kind of fell into pediatrics. Like I always, when I'm doing communication teaching, I always tell people like, I was that kid at university where I put the fire guard around me if children came round. Like I didn't like children, particularly like I didn't dislike them, but I was the youngest of my family. Like I've got an older sister, um, and we're not massively close. Um, I've got kind of older cousins and stuff. But again, they didn't really live very close. And they were all older than me. So I'd never really been around a child. And it now sounds really stupid, but I was just like, they were just like blobs of goop that went to the same coffee shop or blobs of goop that went to the same restaurant that I did. Um, and I've always had friends that were really like excited when children came around so like at uni I lived with a midwife um, and there were seven of us in the uni house and the rest of them were girls so like if someone did bring a kid around like there would be like four people that would go in like ooh and ah over this child so kind of by the time it got to my point I was a bit like oh this is getting a bit old for the family so I kind of had stood back um so yeah, I had no idea how to speak to children. Didn't like they were aliens to me, really, in my world. So I applied to do um, a, an elective at the Evelina, um, and they kept on turning me down. So I popped out to the Queen Elizabeth and had the most amazing time. There's a, a lady down there called Fiona who was absolutely in, 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 instrumental in my career. She was really kind. She was. A bit like a mother figure on in terms of placement, <laughs> both in telling me off normally about stuff that were, wasn't re work related, like when are you going to buy a house? Um, but that kind of really kind of motherly figure um, and absolutely loved the way that the MDT was there. And I found I got invited in to the wider MDT without really ha even having to push the door very hard. And it was an amazing six months. I was down in Woolwich and um, the commute was not so fun from Putney, but really amazing rotation. Everyone was super friendly. Um, and kind of after that post, I got um, an adult band seven post in vascular. 
And the patients just didn't do what I asked them to do. And you'd spend ages doing a dosset box and then you'd see them throw it in the bin on the way out of the hospital. And it just broke my heart that all my hard work checking the dosset box just went in a bin. Um, so there was an opportunity to re-rotate into the Evelina as a band seven. So I rotated in and then they never got rid of me. I um, A permanent job came up there. And so I applied for that. And yeah, kind of that was the start of my peds history. But I could have equally as gone down kind of oncology, did a rotation there and absolutely loved it. And so what I would say to people listening is, if you've got something you're massively passionate about, definitely go with it. But also don't close yourself off to all of those things. Because if you'd have asked me 15 years ago when I was kind of just going on my pre-reg in hospital, that I was going to be a pediatric pharmacist and, you know, I'd be doing uni modules and teaching people about kids medicines I'd have been like no I think you've got the wrong person absolutely <laughs> got the wrong person um and now I couldn't really see myself anywhere else except for kind of maybe a kind of a leadership position I feel quite similarly I, I as a as a resident I did my three months and I really enjoyed it I loved like you said the 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 value that you have and the fact that doors are open, that they want you as pharmacists to be part of everything. They they go overboard with wanting pharmacists and you're like, no, we don't need to be involved with yeah. that. No, no, join us, join us. And you're like, no, 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 no thanks, next time. Um, you know, they really go all in in terms of uh, wanting our support, which is an amazing part of being a pharmacist in this specialist area. Um, you're not fighting for pharmacy's corner all the time, which can happen with adult care and is hard. Um, a really challenging aspect in terms of, of adult life because you're really having to push boundaries and push for pharmacy to get funding for different, you know, roles within the, um, you know, the ward areas or, you know, how can we support um, the the services or having to highlight errors in order to get more money? And they just don't just see the impact that we can make. Um, and with pediatrics, I just it's it's like it's it's always been there. Yeah, you know, you find that the consultants, you know, uh, you know, love having their sort of second hand like they they use you as a backup system to prevent errors because they know how risky it is to prescribe with children and as a resi I went on that three month rotation and I was fearful of using my green pen on a drug chart so I loved it but I felt it was out of my comfort zone because you're just so used to being with adults every three months and you rotate to all these different specialties and it was just kind of I enjoyable but a little bit scary yeah what do you think would have made it less scary for you oh good question I think no I, I I liked being put out of my comfort zone and just going onto the ward and being expected to cover the ward yeah but I think more content within the university course would be a start number one we are lacking, here I am banging on about it, we are lacking information on the university degree. We get one module, and not even a module, what am I saying? Not a module, a three-hour lecture in yeah. fourth year to cover everything peds. I mean, it's crazy. And if I had had more understanding of pediatrics and children um, and everything that's involved with screening a prescription or knowing more information about drug dosing, unlicensed medicines like crushing and dispersing tablets or how you approach a pediatric patient in terms of pharmacokinetics and what's the difference between an ENA and a 15-year-old in terms of how you dose a patient and having the awareness and knowing the resources yeah. would be a good place to start because when you sign on that dotted line, your initials and your date, you feel very responsible for that drug that you're signing and you know the risk of error is huge if you make a screw up and I think that scared yeah. the bejesus out of me and I think it's interesting isn't it because I think a lot of pediatric pharmacists will know the days before the BNFC and I think in some ways the BNFC's lulled 
the institutions and, and, and systems into a bit of a, a false sense of security because we now actually have a little bit of evidence, not enough. And a lot of the stuff in the BNF, the evidence base isn't as strong as it would be in adults or it's a historic evidence base and you can do a whole lecture on that. Um but I do think now we've got this kind of book that tells us the doses and stuff. I think sometimes people then, as you say, don't necessarily appreciate all of the background stuff that we learn in in adults that tells us when the book isn't right. And I'd love to see, you know, every university when they do cardiology to do arrhythmias in children alongside arrhythmias in adults or when you're doing about diabetes, whacking somebody that's, you know, four. And I think that's personally how I think we we introduce more paediatrics into every setting that we do really early on, a kind of basics fundamental of paediatrics. And then we start building in cases in every single in every single disease that they do, because there's very few di diseases in the world that a child won't possibly get or wouldn't get a variant of. So for even things like dementia, you kind of think of that as a care of the elderly disease, but the very similar diseases in children that present in a similar way that might use quite similar medicines. And so I think it's really important, you know, as you say, that we try to ramp it up because every single pharmacist is going to treat a child at some point once they're qualified. And oh, absolutely. And this is what I wanted yeah. to say as well to just tie that conversation is that you work in a community pharmacy, you see kids with prescriptions all the time, yeah. but you don't have the, the necessary, you don't have the training to screen that prescription. You rely on the BNFC and you genuinely don't know what other resources to use a lot of the time that it, you're in the community. You also have pharmacists in, in GP surgeries managing kids yeah. all the time. And if you could increase the amount of knowledge that they have and make them more comfortable dealing with children, you can potentially protect them from having to come in to A&E to deal with things like viral induced wheeze or asthma or, um, you know, I think it would be quite scary to deal with a type one diabetic in a GP surgery that's a child. They wouldn't really know where to start. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that even at Evelina, for example, like our guidelines aren't national. Our guidelines sit within our trust and they're not accessible to other people. So you forget how much knowledge that we have available to us in-house. And I think as well, like, so I've just done some training with the RPS and I, I did quite a lot around the GP space when I did my role at CHIP, which was the Children and Young People's Health Partnership as it was back then. And I think as well with paediatrics, people are so worried about the communication style and all of that jazz that it's really challenging to go into a position where you're not necessarily used to dealing with a consultation with a parent, a child, and then maybe another sibling that's, you know, stealing some of your brain waves because they're not being disruptive, but they're being a kid in the background and kind of trying to put yourself and manage that situation. And then also deal with a clinical area that you might not necessarily be as, as comfortable or familiar with. Because I know definitely when I worked in, in primary care, I used to offer clinics with nurses or, or pharmacists quite regularly. If, say, they were doing asthma reviews for adults, I'd say, OK, well, you know, let's do some joint clinics. Why don't I come in and run your clinic for you for two or three occasions, if you can book them back to back with younger children? Um, and let's start edging your years down. You can see how I work. And then I will sit there as a safety net in the back whilst you work. And actually, it was a really good way to get people that, you know, and I, I often think of paediatrics as stretching people. So having a chat with someone about where they feel confident. So that might be, I'm really confident with asthma with adults or I'm really confident in COPD. Okay, so let's get you confident with asthma. Once we've got you confident in asthma, let's get you confident with asthma over 12 years. And then let's get you confident from five years and above with a diagnosis. And then let's get you confident without a diagnosis. And how do we get people on that journey? Um, and I that, that was one of the I think it's really difficult to say this whilst I'm sat with a gosh lanyard on. Um, I think that was one of my favourite jobs in the world. I absolutely loved that job, uh, cycling around Lambeth and Southwark, popping into GP practices, running my own clinics, um, 
kind of having a chat with people and just that I suppose that's where my love of education and that kind of education role came through. Okay, so rewind just a minute. We'll yeah. definitely get back to that. <laughs> when when you worked at Evelina in yeah. a band seven sort of rotational job, um, I guess what what were the advantages of working in a rotational junior position in a tertiary hospital? What did you love about it? So I think people at the moment, and this is controversial, and I totally get the cost of living crisis and the need to earn enough to be able to sustain a lifestyle that you want. I really found it valuable to be a band six and a band seven for quite a while. And um, so I, I stayed in those roles for quite a while um, compared to kind of what we're, we're seeing right now. And I think what was really good about that was it really gave me a breadth of different clinical areas. So for example, I went to neonates for a year. I did cardiology for, for nine months. So I really... I was there long enough to be able to get a really deep feel and learn and do projects and know the team and make an impact, but also move on because what I learned in neonates, I could apply in metabolics. And again, it's a bit like when I was chatting about pre-reg, it's about be that exposure to lots of different teams. I think if I'd have specialized in say one area much earlier on, I'd have only really got to see that one team. And in that band seven job, I worked with over a hundred people over the course of that year, uh, over the course of those years, in terms of the amount of nurses and doctors and allied health and other pharmacy staff. And every interaction with someone different, you pick up different things um, and you figure out what you like and what you don't like. I've always been quite lucky. I've kind of liked everything, uh, which sometimes makes the job more difficult. Um, but no, loved being able to kind of rotate round. And I think the great thing at the band seven level was the rotations were a bit longer. So you got a little bit more responsibility, but you still had people to call upon. Um and also being able to try and eke out little bits that were for you. So, for example, um, I started a uh, gastro uh, nutrition round. So before um, at Evelina, everyone does their own PN. So what I used to do is go um, with the dietitian and a doctor and we'd review everyone that had been on it for more than seven days. Because actually it's quite difficult if you're doing it day to day to really helicopter out and see maybe actually you need to reduce the calories or increase it. And the band seven job, because I was there for quite a while and without sound a bit big headed, but like I got to a point where I could do my what I needed to do in probably less time than I needed for the whole week, which freed me up to do these new roles that I kind of created to help, you know, broaden my skill set. Whereas I think if I'd have jumped really quickly, you're always kind of catching up and you never get over that kind of halfway mark that you, you're kind of a bit more knowledgeable than they're expecting. And then that frees you up. So, you know, I was able to host research people from, you know, the undergraduate, um, I think they did it in third year at that time to do projects with me. And that was really exciting. Amazing. And Evelina, I mean, the way that it it's, it is a small family. We're a small team. So as a, as a junior rotational pharmacist, you know you've got the backup of some seriously amazing experienced pharmacists. I mean, Will is like yeah. 28, 29 years of experience in pediatrics and renal disease. And I go to him all the time for support and as do everyone. everyone. Yeah. You know, he's a fountain of knowledge. Um, and you know, you know, you can rely on that person. They're approachable. They'll pick, you know, pick up the phone and just call him or bleep him and he will be there for you. Or you want to go through a complex patient, he's going to be there for you. And and that's, you know, a safety net, especially in pediatrics when you sometimes do feel outside your comfort zone. And you have to remember, like if you're on a general medical ward like Mountain Ward, you've got neonates all the way up until 18 year olds on your ward with any disease that can float your way. So your knowledge is is extremely broad. What skills you put into place for a neonate and how you clinically screen a prescription for them is completely different to a 17 year old who's come in for an exacerbation of asthma. You know, how you manage the family who you talk to. You're obviously not talking to the baby, but with a 15, 16, 17-year-old, you can have a really in-depth consultation with them personally, with yeah. a parent potentially in the background, or 
the parents not even around and you can speak to them individually, which is amazing. Um, so I do love the idea of that rotational job. And you're right. I wish people would stay in the rotational jobs for longer because the amount of knowledge that you gain, the experience, the skill and truly understanding what it is that you like and what you don't like is 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 golden when it comes to a hospital job. And with pediatrics, when you come into it, you are coming in slightly blind because you're going into what feels like a mini adult world. You're learning everything from scratch. So it takes a little bit longer to kind of, you know, get used to the rotations. And there's not the same overlap that you would have with adults. Like you could be on an emergency admissions ward and see loads of diseases. You've been exposed to diabetes, you know, type two or, you know, heart failure. You've got, you know, hypertension. You could go to a surgical ward, but still have that overlap. But sometimes in a tertiary center and with children having less kind of comorbidities compared to adults you're kind of in a new territory all the time yeah um you know like you said there's less guidelines available you know there's less evidence so you are relying on experience from consultants but the greatest part about being in pediatrics is how open our consultants are to conversations or trying something new or saying hey we've used this in clinic five times we're gonna give it a go and you're Mm. like okay um you know it's very different and i and i love that it's it's quite unique to to what we do on a day-to-day basis absolutely i mean i still when i practice still have to go to you know that kind of first principles of university teaching whether it's kinetics or you know the you know the way that tablets are going to work or what's the impact if I crush and disperse them on the c-max like all of that stuff that you get taught and you're like oh am I ever going to use it in pediatrics you really do because there isn't necessarily as you say that guidance to say well this is what you're doing and I think that's what I really loved about peds especially at the kind of band seven level when I was speaking to colleagues in the adult world or where I'd come from I often felt like a policeman I was like you're not doing this guy like you didn't. um whereas in pediatrics that wasn't necessarily the case it was more of a a two-way conversation or a three or a four or a five-way conversation about what do we think's the best in this situation and it for me it really felt like personalized care Absolutely. And they would come to you before they write the prescription. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, in adults, you feel like sometimes they write pres- the prescription knowing that pharmacy is probably going to flag it and they wait for your bleep or your call and then they fix it afterwards. But with pediatrics, again, like on the ward as well, the doctors are around all the time. They're in their office or they're on the ward rounds and they know where we live. So it's very easy for them to communicate with us. Hey, we're thinking about doing this. What are your thoughts? And I think as well, it influences the types of pharmacists you're going to work with. Because I think if you speak to any pediatric pharmacist throughout the world, probably like they've had that moment where they felt really uncomfortable or they felt out of their depth or they had a problem that they they just needed to sit down with someone that kind of speaks the same language to bounce ideas off. And I think that's what you were coming across with like with Will is that willingness to just kind of drop things and come and and have that conversation with you on the ward or down in the office to be able to bounce ideas. Because again, we don't always know that we can go there for the right answer. So sometimes it is just kind of getting, you know, people together and having a bit of chat and figuring out what's going to work. And I think that really permeates through pediatrics in terms of having that supportive environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we're quite fortunate the way our pharmacy is and the dispensary is quite small. And we got the little office space in the back. It's still the same. But all the seniors sit in there. So if you've got a problem and you come downstairs and you ask a question, you will get feedback from four different people. And it's kind of, again, a pharmacy, you know, multidisciplinary approach from all the specialists, but it helps you to deal with what you kind of have to do for your patient in that moment. And I think it's, I think it's not just institutions. I think most pediatric people I speak to, whether it's, you know, Everleader is amazing. At Gosh, we're the same. I speak to people at Birmingham Children's, you know, chatting to the pharmacist over at Hillingdon. She's absolutely amazing and would do absolutely the same. And I think there is something about pediatric pharmacists as a breed. I don't know whether we're born that way or whether our training kind of makes us that way. But I think all of us recognize that sometimes what we do is a little bit scary and therefore 
when somebody asks for help, everyone's more than happy to to provide some guidance. Yeah, we have created quite the community. Yeah. Actually, that leads on to uh, quite well is that how did you get involved with uh, MPPG, so, which is the Neonatal and Pediatric Pharmacist Group? Tell us about your how you got that opportunity. Um, so we, I, I, okay, so they kind of host, host conferences or kind of after work teaching and networking events. And we hosted a couple at the Evelina. So every single time they will say, is anyone willing to host the next one? And essentially it's finding a speaker, finding a room, and then we used to find somewhere to have dinner afterwards. So it's really challenging to get people to do it, but it's not actually a load of work to do it, if that makes sense. Um, and as long as you're quite well known in your hospital and you can rope a doctor in or a nurse or another pharmacist to come and have a chat, it kind of organises itself. Um, and I would um, organised a couple of events at the Evelino along with the team, um, you know, to, to talk about, you know, sleep disorders or maybe host something with the neonatal team when I was rotating in there and then just kind of fell into it. I think it sounds really bad looking back at my career. I think I've just fallen into where I am. Um, I don't think there was particularly a lot of strategic focus to get me there. Um, and they had a, um, one of the co-chairs at the time was stepping down because they'd got quite a lot on. And therefore, you know, they, they asked if anyone would be kind of willing to kind of take that on. And I popped my hand up. I didn't really think they'd say yes. Um, and they did. And it was brilliant. And I really, really enjoyed it. Amazing. Yeah. And it's it's a really good opportunity to network with people, you know, and and grow your your connections within our, our field as well. And um, I think it's been uh, instrumental in terms of education for our community and it will continue to be that way, which is really nice. Um, obviously, I went to uh, the Clinical Pharmacy Congress on the weekend on behalf of MPPG, yeah. um, was trying to convince people to join um, our group. And there was a lot of people who didn't really necessarily think that they would, I guess, there would be any value in them joining but we, we we opened some eyes there were community pharmacists who were there and when we said to them but how many you know prescriptions do you actually review that come from children or gp practice pharmacists who are looking after children within their community that actually it's really valuable to be part of a group where you're getting education you're part of conferences and just opening their eyes to other opportunities um that they think are sort of hospital only roles and I think MPPG have picked up on that as well, which is really admirable of them in terms of that now they've got a community pharmacy champion on their board. And I think that's an absolute game changer for them in terms of kind of helping them as a group, but also helping tie people in so that we do break down that image of it being a hospital only group. And I think you know, what UKCPA has done really well in their kind of groups is if you look at the heart failure or like the heart group that used to just be hospital pharmacists maybe 10 years ago, maybe some people from the CCG, but they've done a really nice transition into being really relevant for everybody. Yeah, and absolutely so. I think people underestimate how many children they see. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to raise that profile and that awareness, which is, yeah part of part and parcel of our role yeah um another thing i wanted to ask you was that you did your master's in uh research yes, maybe you I forgot did. about this yes, a while ago I did. um with kcl what um motivated you uh to do that at that time so I'd done a couple of audits. I'd um, kind of been involved a little bit with um, some, some kind of small research projects. GSTT was really research focused at that point. You've got Kathy McKenzie there. You've got Steve Tomlin there that was doing loads of research, uh, research. Sarah doing research in kind of um, pumps in, in PICU. She's so still on the pump game. She is I'm still <laughs> on the pump game. I saw, <laughs> I, I saw some papers. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a real sense and buzz around research in the institution um and it was really effective so and i again i kind of thought oh well, i'm probably a bit too junior they'll never pick me but um did some great coaching with uh, kathy and kind of looking at what i had done and i think it was 
you know, I don't, I like, I'd only presented at a couple of conferences and written um, a couple of things that went into the archives of uh, disease in childhood. And I think that imposter syndrome that often pharmacists have felt like that wasn't going to be good enough. Um, so it was really nice to chat down, sit down with someone and say, actually, you know, why not try it? Um, so popped an application in and yeah, got the fellowship. Um, I was really interested in that clinical academic career route. Um, wanted to develop the evidence base for paediatrics, having seen that it wasn't there and thought, you know what, this is a great way for me to dip my toe in it in a quite a safe way. Um, I wouldn't really class myself as a career maverick in terms of like, I would not necessarily be the kind of person that would go for a fixed term job for one year or things like that. So it really was quite nice for me to have that safety net to know that I was coming back to something. And uh, how did you, I guess, utilise a lot of the knowledge and the experience that you gained during that time into your role? So, yeah, so I think it was really interesting. So I joined um, a large study. It was called the Link Study. And I, um, my supervisor was a nurse. So Jackie Sturt, absolutely amazing woman, you know, nothing she doesn't know about qualitative research, absolutely inspirational, worked with a really nice team. So um, as part of the fellowship, you do your research masters, but you have to do your own research project, but you're kind of given to a research team. So my research team was looking at two-way digital communication across 20 different sites throughout the UK and seeing what the impact of it was on patient care. And listeners today are probably going to be thinking oh why is that relevant we're all doing you know Skype consultations but this was kind of oh I'm trying to figure out how old I was about seven eight years ago before the pandemic so not many people were doing it people were still feeling a little bit uncomfortable about kind of a WhatsApp group they didn't really know whether they could use Skype or they couldn't use Skype so I kind of got placed in this large diabetes research group with a couple of postdocs, a couple of people doing their PhD. And I just lived in that office for a year and I just soaked up so much. And I think I was the only pharmacist. So they loved the fact that I brought really practical knowledge about drugs and a different way of thinking about things. So there was two nurses, a psychologist, myself, all in a, in a room and kind of working on different projects, but kind of asking each other different questions. I started teaching. So I used to teach at the uh, nursing school and got on a couple of programs teaching because, again, I was kind of like the only pharmacist in the nursing school at the time because I, I was doing it. And Jackie was great. And I think going into academia is another great sector that's quite good at if you show interest and you're willing to maybe do a couple of extra hours at the end of the day or do a little bit more they'll open doors for you um so yeah so I went on this 20 site visit around around the country kind of interviewing people and ex um seeing kind of what they'd done. So learned loads of practical skills in terms of how do you do qualitative interviews how but also that could have been really abstract, but it, it really helped me think about the way I communicate with patients. You know, how do I get them to trust me really early on? Because when you're doing qualitative inter interviews or hosting a podcast, you've got to get people to believe in you really quickly. You've got to make them feel really comfortable with you really quickly because you've got a 30 minute slot with them and you need that data but also how are you going to get that out of them, especially when it's somebody's lived experience? Because it's very easy, especially I was speaking to a lot of healthcare professionals, that they go into the kind of bish bash bosh of setting up the service rather than necessarily the emotional connections that they have or their fears. So like one nurse was saying, you know, she was really uncomfortable and, you know, felt really uncomfortable about the way that she looked when she was doing video um, calls. And it was really interesting in the interview to to make her feel safe enough to be able to explore that with me. And, you know, part of what we published was around the fact that when you're face to face, no one's, there's no risk somebody's taking a, like an image of you. And that they were really worried that somebody could be filming or doing a screen recording of their Skype consultation. And they were then quite, they, you know, it 
played into their body body dysmorphia. And it was just really interesting to see how you took somebody on that journey in a kind of 30 minute, 40 minute interview. And then the kind of aftercare after the interview to make sure that they were, that, you know, you'd explored something that you totally didn't know where it was going to go. Like that was not where I thought that interview was going to go. Um, it, it, in kind of the pre-interview stuff that had never come up. We'd never heard that in, I think we did 200 interviews, which was crazy for a qualitative study. It was a bit of a weird one, but in the 200 interviews we'd done, like that had never come up with anybody else. And it's how do you manage that? And how do you manage that uncertainty and not necessarily knowing where the journey is going to take you, but feel comfortable in going on that journey with somebody and then bringing that back into patient care and you know i feel much more confident speaking to people and you know going into their homes and chatting to them about medicines and and how do you manage things like that and that all came from kind of the research degree and yeah there was loads of really practical things about how do you do a lit search and how do you do this but i think it was pockets and little snapshots and moments like that that really made me think oh wow yeah this has been a really useful um, way to spend a year. Amazing. No, I love that. It yeah. sounds really interesting. And I can see just from your journey that there are also pockets of where you've been really passionate about educating other people. Yeah. So whether that might be juniors, like you said, once you were more capable of completing your war duties, you it opened up time to allow you to do more projects or get involved with education and training. You were teaching nurses, for example, and even within your day to day, you were trying to help people yeah. explore maybe their fears or things that they weren't very confident in. And you were, so you were like, mm, I'm going to share this. And I love that. That's great. It's um, demonstrated how much you enjoy supporting and developing other people tell me a little bit about um i guess you were at evelina you did all you know your rotations how did that lead towards a um a role in academia um did you go straight from evelina to an education and training job in great ormond street no so i um i went to do a job at the children and young people's health partnership um which was a fascinating and amazing job. I absolutely loved it. So it was um, a charity funded project um, across four different organisations. So the Evelina Children's Hospital, King's College London, South London and the Maudsley and GP Partners. Um, and we worked in Lambeth and Southwark and it was a randomised control trial. So we were looking at a huge health intervention um, across two different sectors. So half of the GPs in Lambeth were randomised to be able to access our community service. Half of them weren't and the same in, Lam uh, in Southwark. Um, so there was four asthma nurses, two epilepsy nurses, two nurses that looked after like constipation and eczema. Uh, during the start off of the project, they'd asked for half a band seven pharmacist. We managed to talk them up to a full time 8A because um, the, the lady was lovely and Grid Wolf was amazing. And I think actually what we were able to show with pharmacy is that we've got such a broad skill set that there's loads of places you can plug the gaps when it comes to a large project like that. Um, so I turned up on day one and they gave me a blank piece of paper and they were like, we're not really sure what a pharmacist can do. So could you write something that would fill like 40 hours a week? There you are. Make yourself a job. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So the, like there were some broad aims um, and it changed massively throughout the scope of the kind of two and a half, three years I was there. And I loved it because it was a randomized control trial and there was a whole research arm at the King's. So Ingrid's uh, an academic, a clinical academic, um, lots of emphasis on public health. So I, you know, some weeks I'd be really involved with the research team and trying to translate what we were doing in the service into the research. So for example, if they were saying, let's collect this data, I'd be like, there's no way we can do that. So really, really interesting pulling up on kind of my master's work. And, and I absolutely kind of loved being able to sit in that space whilst also, um, 
kind of running around the park with kids to see if they were asthmatic. Um, I used to run a lovely little clinic out of a church in Streatham, which is where I live now. And the vicar used to come and give me a cup of tea in between my patients um, because I'd just done my prescribing course and kind of advanced assessment courses. Um, And again, I kind of ran my own clinics. I'd also kind of run some joint clinics with our nurses or they'd pick up the phone and be like, Richard, I'm not confident about this medicine. Can you help me? And we'd kind of Skype or we'd chat. And then after about maybe six months, uh, we decided to pitch to what were CCGs at the time, an intervention whereby we would go in and actually do a virtual clinic. So it was a model that Gronje had developed in adults for respiratory, and we were going to steal it um, because plagiarize wherever you can, obviously give them credit, but if it works somewhere else, steal it. Um, So we did that. So we we would get GP practice staff and they'd talk us through their patients. And um, I did the first couple with the consultant and then the consultant felt that they weren't adding value. And so just sent me off on my own. And sometimes you'd get one grumpy GP um, that had two to three hours that they were paid to run through patients with you. Sometimes you would turn up and they'd close the practice. So I remember the first time I went in uh, to one of the GP practices and they'd closed the practice for the afternoon for me to go in and do this virtual clinic. So there's six GP partners, 10 GPs and trainees GPs, two practice pharmacists, four practice nurses, the receptionist, the whole shebang. And then there's like little old me being like, hi, I'm Richard. (laughs) Um, Yeah, yeah, but uh, loved it. Um, Really varied. Um, And as kind of people came in and out of um, the the project team, um, I kind of picked up like a little bit more on mental health and mental health counselling, um, kind of to fill gaps. And I think it really showed me that pharmacists have such a broad skill set that we can kind of lend ourselves to much more than necessarily we think we can. Um, so whether that was kind of on a Tuesday being sent to speak to the GP Federation to give a talk about why the 300 GPs in the room should buy into our service and advertise the service and, you know, doing pathway development to a Wednesday running a clinic in South London, seeing whether people needed to step up or down their asthma treatment to maybe the Thursday working with the GP and then Friday doing a bit with the research team. Nice yeah. bit of variety in that job. Yeah. I love it. And I love a job with variety. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've been enjoying, uh, similar to you, um, uh, pediatrics with education. I've been doing um, palliative care as part of my job and then lots of formulary. Ah, brilliant. Yes. So uh, do you remember when the formulary was the orange book, by the way? Yes. Yeah, so now it's gone <laughs> digital. People don't even know it's orange. Uh, we've still got a copy in the Evelina and I used it as a resi in Oxford all the time. Yeah. And when I first came to Evelina, I was like, oh my goodness, You're like this impact. was made here. Yeah. And now we get to change it like into a proper app. Yeah. And like use it online, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, no, I love I love the mix between pediatrics and education. I love the variety. And like you said, pharmacists have such a broad range of skills. And I mean, just from that job alone, you utilized literally anything and everything. And there's a lot that we don't learn in the university degree that is still missing. And I know they have to cover their bases. Um, but there's so much more that I think that we need to include. Like you said, business is kind of missing from that whole side of of your um, career development. And you learn through experience when a lot of things I think are really valuable in terms of life skill. Like sometimes we're doing sales. We're like marketing yeah. what we're doing. You're having to do big presentations um, to, you know, like you said, to GP federations. Where do you kind of gain that skill except putting yourself out your comfort zone and trying which a lot of people are fearful of doing. Um, So it's really valuable to see how you stepped up and how you said, actually, this is an opportunity for me to get X, Y, Z 
so that I can do it comfortably next time. Um, and we need to encourage our juniors to do a little bit more of that um, to help them to, to grow as professionals and also understand what they like doing, what they don't like doing, what they're good at, what they're not so good at. Finding gaps in practice, which you pretty much identified from all of your experiences from the kind of start of your journey as a resident. Like, these are the things I, you know, want more experience with. So let me sign up for uh, a master's. I like doing consultations. Um, so I will teach other people to do the same. Um, and you were filling in the gaps pretty much like an advanced pharmacy framework. Um, yeah. Maybe you're not utilizing it in the moment, but actually that's what you were doing, which is amazing. And I love that. And I think it is one of those things that is really important that as people go on their journey, that they they take some time out. And I think that can be quite difficult. And whether it's your tube journey in, or if you're listening from outside of London, your car journey in, you know, do you want to listen to that next Britney Spears song or Beyonce or whatever you want to listen to? Or do you want to just have a quiet moment to reflect on kind of what you're liking? And that's what I do on my tube journeys. So I used to spend loads of time like just messaging people and stuff, but actually I now use them to have a bit of a think about, you know, what went well this uh, week? Where did I not do so great this week? Or, you know, what is it that I loved? And it just get a bit of headspace to think about stuff. Because um, I think that's when you can figure out where you need to go next. Absolutely. I'm a yeah. massive fan of journaling and I've used quite a few different diaries to support a reflective practice. And I talk about that a lot on the podcast because actually I've highlighted so many things that I want to do or things that I'm not very good at or I'm not mm. confident with um, that I'd like to practice more of. Um, I like to appreciate things that have gone well or not so well and try to make improvements for the week after or the month after. So that sort of reflective journey is something that I'm trying to promote on the podcast all the time for for the younger generation because it really opens your eyes to a lot of good bad and improvements in between yeah and I, I love the fact that you journal because I cannot write it down like I'm all I'm one of those people that I like if I have a to-do list I'll write a to-do list and then I'll lose the to-do list so everything I do is is in my head whereas kind of like that quiet space is really important I'm always really admirable of people that kind of write lists and journal and and take that time because I think that's that's great if that's the way you do it and I yeah but I think that, that reflection is so important, isn't it? Um, and we don't get much quiet time. So no. it's actually quite useful on the train or if you're walking to work or on, on a bus um, or in the car, like you said, to actually turn everything off and allow your mind to be open to thoughts, um, not just about what you need to do for the day, but actually what did you enjoy and appreciate the yeah. good things like today hello we're doing a podcast like Which this is really, really cool exciting. yeah <laughs> totally so, you are going to be on my my friday journey home reflection of what went well this week excellent i yeah. love that tell me a little bit more about what you're doing now in your in your job at great ormond street yeah so i and um, the kind of funding for that old uh, for my community post was kind of winding down and so i had to make a bit of a thought about did i go back into the evelina um, while well, trying to to find some long term funding for it, and then this job popped up, and you know it was training. There was kind of a specialist centre. It's really famous. It had a real buzz about it at the time, and it still does around wanting to change and reflect and think about how we do things differently. So. Again, wasn't really 100% sure if I'd get the role, but I was like, you know what, back into the application, what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, and and did really well, obviously, because I, I was here, which was beautiful that those people thought so. Um, and kind of came and it, it was a really challenging time for the organisation. So we'd had... Um, a not so favourable HGE visit, so the, the educational regulator. So there was lots of improvements to be made and quite a lot of pressure to make the improvements quite quickly. So I really had to hit the ground running in terms of looking at the way that we were training our foundation pharmacists or pre regs as they were at the time and kind of making some really quite radical changes to that training programme to, to make sure that it was up to date. And I think it really highlights 
to me, the importance of organizations having a lead for education that can do that strategic piece. Because I think the role had been split up into different role, different people with conflicting demands. So when I came in, it was great to have a protected person with protected headspace with a, with a focus on education. And though education is everybody's job and everybody's responsibility, it really showed when I came into the organization that we really needed a focus and a champion and somebody that could at every single meeting be like, oh, but what about the training? What about this? How are we going to do this? What? And often that's my job is just reminding people that we do need to focus on it. And especially, you know, during COVID and things, you know, yes, we needed to pivot our focus but it was about how do we pivot that focus during those really challenging times to make sure that people were supported and trained and developed to do so um so having that kind of dedicated role i think is really important within an organization even if you've got everyone that's really passionate about it um i think that only gets you so far without kind of somebody to be able to kind of drive things forward it's a hard job, you know, trying to keep, uh, I mean, you've got, you've got the, you've got your own passion around education, but not everyone else likes to be an educator. We want everyone to be educators, but it's not always yeah. the way. And also there's this, um, you know, idea of people not finding time mm. to educate others, or they don't have the experience to do the job at the same time as educating someone else. And this is something that I'm focusing on a lot at the Evelina at the moment, because we're getting more students coming through our doors. Yeah. We're, we're extremely busy. We know that resource is tight, but how do we still give the same, if not better, educational service to those students we yeah. have international pharmacists coming from countries all over the world we've got someone with us from norway and sweden we've got a german pharmacist arriving we've got people from hong kong yeah. arriving later this year and they really want to see what uk pharmacy is like what pediatrics is like because they've all got pediatric experience when they come onto the wards they've got 50 questions as they walk onto the ward. How do you do this? Where do you find this? You know, what drugs are available? Like, how do you clinically screen? How do you talk to a patient? Because their services are nowhere near as advanced as we are. A lot of the time they're put on to ward areas with junior pharmacists, so band sevens and up. But those pharmacists find it really challenging to be able to talk at the same time as they think and do the job. And with pediatrics, you've got so many things going through your head. Yeah. You're not just signing off simple medications where it is sort of a standard dose for all adults. You know, the aspirin 75, you're really having to use your knowledge in terms of pharmacokinetics, your calculator, your brain's firing on, you know, administration is that buckle, you know, one mil, how do you give a one mil buckle dose? No, that's not possible. You know, dealing with parents, dealing with the nurses, administration issues, like it's constant firing on the wards of questions, plus you're having to speak at the same time. And they find it really, really hard. But it's really important that we, that well, me, well, I, uh, mould this role yeah. to become better at training other people. Yeah. Um, and we've identified quite quickly that it is challenging for them. So I just step up and kind of make more time for those international pharmacists and for those students. But if I'm not around, the workforce has to do the job and we need to make sure that they're trained up to support other people. But it's really hard to get that done. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting, isn't it? Like there's a couple of things that really resonated with what you said. And I'm going to pick them out if that's okay. Like that thought that we don't have time or it's not within our scope. Like if you read a job description, I bet you anything, a fifth of any pharmacy job descriptions on education and training. Absolutely. So when people come back to me and be like, oh, well, I don't really like it. Well, I don't really like doing finance, but you know what? <laughs> I have to. Like, I don't really like doing loads of things about like my job. That's not where my passion is. But I totally understand that to be able to do all this amazing stuff, that I have to get these other bits done for the organization because that's what they need. Um, and I and I think that's sometimes my critical challenge back to people is, okay, but it really is part of your role. And I think we do need a bit of a culture shift. Yes, there's going to be people 
that this is their passion and absolutely that's where they're going to exp- expand their scope. A bit like some people are really passionate about research and other people aren't. And that's fine, but there's got to be a baseline of what we're expecting. And I definitely, when I came into GOSH, I, like when I first started, there was a, only two to three people were allowed to be tutors. And so we've gone on a real journey together in terms of kind of building that confidence. And I think that's really important that we normalize it, that everybody's got to train. Uh, train. And you see that in every organization. And then we start to give them the skills. And as you say, it is really hard in pharmacy because like if you're a surgeon and you're not great at training, somebody can see at least what you're doing. Like they can see how you're holding the scalpel or where you're cutting or what you're doing. It's a visual specialty. And yes, there might be decisions that a a poor educator might not be able to explain, but there is something to see. Whereas in pharmacy, all of it's in the head. Like I always laugh and joke, like if I was just a walking brain with a voice box, I could probably still do my job. Um, Like one of those little um, kind of sci-fi creatures. So until you start verbalizing and it, and often we don't. So I think one of the things really is around the way we train people is to normalize going up with our kind of junior pharmacists, but also clinical technicians. It's not just about our pharmacists and say, okay, talk to me through your thought process. And I think we need to get better and you know certain diplomas so we use the ucl diplomas are really good at this in terms of and the rps uses them the case-based discussions the mini kexes and that's really aimed at kind of getting people to talk through what they're doing in a specialty where there's a computer and you click buttons and you've no idea whether they winged it and got the right answer or they had loads of that amazing thought processes that you were talking about. Because at the end of the day, they either verify the drug or they don't. So unless you actually ask them what's going through their head, you've no idea. <laughs> like you've no idea whether they thought about formulation or thought about like renal function or the interaction or developmental pharmacokinetics because they either clicked verify or they didn't click verify. Um, so I think, you know, if I had more time and and I'm trying to build my team up here is being able to do a bit more of that kind of hands-on coaching because I think that's how we normalize it because if you're used to somebody asking you that then you can do that with an international person because they're doing your job for you because when I'm on the ward and I've got a trainee with me or I've got somebody that's learning I don't do a lot of the work. I'm not going to lie. Like I don't do a lot of the clinical work. They go off and then they present it back to me. And I either will ask them additional information until I'm comfortable that I can sign it off or they will give me all of the information and we'll sign it off together. And I think that's kind of thinking of it, thinking of it in that point of view of I'm not doing my work and then having to watch somebody else do their work I think we need to start thinking about the way that we do our work a bit like the doctors do you know the consultants do a lot of work but a lot of their work is listening to and understanding what other people have done and either saying yes that's fine crack on or oh actually we we either you or I both need to go on and get a bit more information and I think that model is still not necessarily 100% embedded in pharmacy. And I think that's where we need to do. We need to step up our game. Yeah. Massively. And that culture shift for sure needs to change. And it's a hard one to change because we are limited with resource. So it's really like even the idea of MPharm students spending so many more hours with us in the hospital is overwhelming. And we're getting a lot of pushback (laughs) that we do not have time. We do not have time. Um, Especially because the funding's dropped. Yeah, so like you're it, asked to do more with less funding, and everyone's feeling stretched, aren't they? But I, I, I totally agree that that is challenging. It's stressful, but at the end of the day, you're training the next generation of pharmacists. If you want them to be good at their job, and you don't want to have to like pick up all of the additional training you'll have to do once they're qualified, this is your opportunity to actually train the next generation and make them and mold them into the humans and professionals that you want them to be. And if we take that kind of mindset with all aspects of education and training, like we're winning. Yeah. And I think of it very much similar to you in terms of we're not 
getting more work, we're just shifting when we do the work. Because we need them to be able to hold those consultations in a confident way. And at the moment, we're often getting some people that can do that on graduation and and registration and some people that can't. And it's about shifting that work, isn't it? And it's always going to be difficult when you've you've got the two systems in place. Um, But absolutely, I think it really is a time to invest in people. But I think as well, thinking about the way that we do things. So, you know, at this stage with our foundation pharmacists, like I'm expecting them to be doing their by chatting to their patients and doing things and then presenting those cases back to back to me in a really structured way like the medics do that allows me to see where their thought processes are really robust where they need additional support where I can guide them with questions which teaches them because they'll know what questions to, or what to think about but actually that that time spent I'm doing two jobs at the same time yeah. And I think that's really, really, really important. Yeah, no, I completely agree. You talked a little bit about uh, wanting to grow your team. What's the future looking like for uh, education and training as 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 a role for Great Ormond Street? So I think we need to go international, as we always do, because, you know, we are gosh, we've got an amazing reputation. And we've got a lot to give and a lot to offer. Um, so I would love us to start doing a little bit more in the space of kind of postgraduate education. And we're really, really lucky here at Gosh. We're supported by the Gosh Learning Academy. So our charity helped uh, pop some seed funding in to really grow our educational offer, because as an institution, we're kind of really well known for our clinical care. You know, we treat some of the sickest children in the world and we do it really well. We're quite well known for our research, but our kind of education wasn't necessarily on the same level. And if we look at nursing, we've been running modules with universities and postgraduate masters for years and years and years. But still, that kind of arm wasn't as wasn't as well recognized as as the other parts of the organization so the charity was really generous and gave us some money to help kind of build business cases and build the infrastructure to enable us to kind of fire on all three cylinders equally um so that's what I'd kind of like to draw upon um with their support in terms of looking at how do we provide more of a national and global presence to educate pharmacists so at the moment you know we come on a journey together but we're we're quite focused in terms of getting our own house in order and making sure that we the training that we provide in-house is really good but how can we unlock all of that knowledge and skills you know our oncology team is absolutely amazing and they are so knowledgeable and really really friendly in terms of being able to to treat children that many other places would find challenging. So how do we unlock that so that we become kind of the big brother and big sister of the UK um, or the big brother and big sister of the world, whereby, you know, if you've got a challenging patient, you want to come and have a chat with us because you know that we're friendly. We, You know that you're going to get some good advice or we're going to help you um, with those skills. And I know other institutions are kind of further ahead on this, but it's a really big market. I think there's more space for everybody because I think as, as we've kind of touched upon a lot in this podcast, you know, everybody's seeing children. We think of paediatrics as a specialism, but it's not really. It's a generalism of people of a certain age group. So I think there's loads of opportunity for organisations to reach outside of our four walls to help others. So that's kind of where I, I'd like to see my team go. Um, but obviously that's going to need additional kind of resources in terms of people to be able to help us have that vision. Um, whether that's kind of developing and delivering courses, getting people in, you know, being more active players with our local universities. And, you know, we've started that journey, but we kind of, that's where, that's where I'd like us to get to. Baby steps in the right direction, Richard. Yeah. Yeah. I look forward to seeing how the team develops and yeah, keep in touch with me and let me know what's been going on in the world of education at Gosh. Um, I really uh, appreciate your time today. I've learnt loads about you and we've got loads in common, which is really exciting. Um, And it was uh, a great opportunity to um, catch up. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no worries.